The Brandon Peters Show may contain explicit language and detailed plot points. For more information on the show, stay tuned to the end of the episode. It's the summer of 93 at 30. Welcome to the Brandon Peters Show and the continued adventures of the summer of 93 at 30 series. A weekend by weekend look at the movies released during the summer of 1993 in the year of our Zeus Returning for another go round again, always we have from the Real of Entertainment, Why So Blue, and out now with Aaron and Abe, it's Aaron Newworth. Hey, and uh, coming in second this week from the rap, Scott Mendelson. Always treated like number two. Oh, we're not gonna flush you away, Scott. Don't you worry. The rap is no deadline. That's what they say. Oh! Indeed. (laughs) I'm taking the fifth on that one. Gotcha. (laughs) Hey, don't worry. He's got this covered. So, uh, yeah, today we have... Yeah. Wow. That was good. There we go. Yeah. (laughs) Sure thing. Today we have four wonderful movies for you this week. A nice uh, variety of a slate here. Um, Something old. Some new... Something... Old that's made new. Go on, finish this thought. Yeah, uh, <laughs> as an old man with a new family member, and uh-huh. a new generation takes on an old generation. New and old, new and old, new uh-huh. and old. Yeah. You YouTube editor, make this make his box the biggest one right now. New <laughs> news. We'll go to news. When I wake up, don't you know I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be the man who brings the news to you. With the first pick in the 1993 NBA draft, the Orlando Magic select Chris Webber. That's your worst segue yet. <laughs> All right. I keep trying to get worse and I keep accomplishing it. So <laughs> this week on June 30th on the NBA draft, Michigan center, Chris timeout Weber was picked first by the Orlando magic and then traded to the golden state warriors for Anthony Penny Hardaway because they already had Shaq. They're like, we don't need two big guys down here. On July 1st, a one-second leap adjustment added to the coordinated universal time clock, UTC. Good. Yes. No idea what that means. Not to be confused with UTI. Um, July 1st, also. I want want to go back to this. There's a second added to a clock? Yeah, it sounds like they added a second A one-second leap adjustment was added to universal time. So we were, like, living a second behind or something? Or maybe they were trying to even things out? The the Earth, Maybe the Earth's core was slowing down, and Aaron Uh. Eckhart stepped into the room and was like, guys, I got an idea. Yeah, so they add one. There used to be a movie about this decision to make the add one second, like a Tetris for the one second. Yes. Someone could. We should do that. Some kind of combination between Groundhog's Day and Oppenheimer. Yes, yes, but for the one-second leap adjustment in 1993 on July the 1st. Our leap adjustment day. Uh, Also that day, Richard Reardon was elected as Los Los Angeles' first Republican mayor in 36 years. Look out for that that, that red wave coming in, taking California by storm, huh? A reminder to tune in to Out Now Podcast commentaries going for I Love L.A. The theme. Yes. <laughs> Which are <laughs> classic action movies from you'll various... Have, you'll have to go back because they're already done by now. <laughs> you can find them. I Love L.A. Them. With four movies about how Los Angeles police officers are awesome. Only three. Okay, right. Three. <laughs> One of them, he comes from Detroit, so it's yeah. all good. Um... Also, uh, another thing on July 1st, a Russian manned spacecraft TM-17 launches into orbit. The space race is the race that never ends. Uh, uh, all, someone goes into space, and then on July 2nd, a boat sinks 
at the Baku, Philippine, and um, 325 people die. So tragedy there. Um, another tragedy the same day, an F-28 crashes at Sarang Aryan Barat, killing 41 people. Aww. And then also the same day, Mo- Muslim fundamentalists in Sivas, Turkey, set a hotel on fire, killing 36 people. That was an awful. That that must be an awful day in the news there. It's Muslim. like, oh, this just in. Oh, Dear Lord. It's like the day you found out Farrah Fawcett died, and then like hours later, Michael Jackson died, and you're like, "What?" But this is like tons of like regular p- civilian people. And you're like, "What? No, stop, world, stop!" Um, smash the like button. Uh, July third, <laughs> smash that subscribe button. This is oh yeah. Uh, July third, Wimbledon at the Wimbledon's women's tennis in the centenary women's singles final. I know Scott, you were following that pretty. <laughs> Here I am. Uh. <laughs> We just lose a second. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, oh, we'll add it back. Uh, uh, Steffi German Steffi Graf beats Czech uh, Jana no- right. Novotna seven six one six and six four. And then on the fourth of July, ninety three, right? Huh? It was ninety three. Ninety three. Oh man, I'm probably playing Game Boy Mario Tennis so much right now. This there is you great. go. Rack attack. Uh, on Fourth of July, uh, Pilar Fort Pilar Fort is crowned the twenty fifth Miss Black America. They had to, you know, it's, cancel your plans. We're staying in and watching Miss Black America tonight. Like Trump definitely it? wasn't there. No, no, he was at Miss Teen. He was did the Teen ones, and that is a fact. That's not a lie. He did the Miss <laughs> Teen pageants. Uh, July Fourth. The best that subscribe button. Oh, geez. Tragedy befalls as a Pizza Hut blimp deflates and lands safely on West 56th Street in New York City. And, West and, I like the way you said that, where like the, the word safely was actually the most downbeat part of the <laughs> sentence. Like, oh no, the Pizza Hut blimp deflated and landed safely. Right. Uh, it's like my wife when we watch Air Emergency and nobody dies in the plane crash. Oh. Sorry. Sorry, Wendy. Everyone got out of this one. We're morbid people. Don't say we. I don't watch that shit. <laughs> uh, so on July 4th at the Wimbledon's men's tennis, Pete Sampras. Oh, no, Pete Sampras close. Uh, no. Pete Sampras beats fellow American Jim Courier 7676366364 for his first of seven Wimbledon titles. Uh, and then our deaths this week are opera singer Boris Kristoff. Uh, Punk rocker Gigi Allen dies of a heroin inter- oh, overdose. Uh, George Spanky McFarland of the Little Rascals passes away. Oh, this is a. And then Fred Gwynn of the Munsters and Car 54, Where Are You? passes away. And Curly, uh, Joe Dorita of the Street Stooges. It's like all the like sitcom stars of back in the day are going away. Uh, baseball player, Hall of Fame pitcher Don Drysdale. Actress Anne Shirley are the people who passed away this week. Um, birthdays born this week: uh, Angela and Amy Lakeberg, who are Siamese twins, and then Ronnie Rodriguez, the actress and rapper Sawitie. Okay. Mm-hmm. These twins. Yes. So, like, are they actually Siamese, or are they just conjoined to twins? Um. They were Siamese twins, and then they were separated weeks later, or something like oh, that. Oh, one of these situations. So they were, yeah, but they were separated weeks later. You think that still happens? I don't know why I would stop. Uh, yeah, yeah, but you know what? It, it doesn't seem like it's a newsworthy thing anymore. I guess for some reason, even though it's yeah, it like, used to be like. I remember those two girls that they would show us all the time. They were like, did school work together? Rode bikes. Yeah, maybe it's just really... something. Maybe it's just another thing the Fairly Brothers eliminated, just like racism. <laughs> That's what they did. That's what they did. Um, they just took the took the steam out of it. Yes, uh, I like stuck on you. I like stuck on you more than Green Room. I would say Green Book, not Green Room. Green Room's a tie. They're both really good. Steam. So <laughs> stuck on you. You guys, yeah. Speaking of twins, you guys remember the Yin Yang Twins? I do not. They they told you to whistle while you twerk. We'll whistle while we talk about <laughs> Snow White. That was a reach. Oh, oh boy. Come on. <laughs>
Walt Disney Pictures presents the greatest animated motion picture of all time. We got a saber! Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Now you can experience the action, the excitement, the wonder and magic of the animated adventure that started it all. And this summer, you can only see it at a theater near you. Walt Disney's classic Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, rated G, starts Friday, July 2nd at a theater near you. All right. Uh, it's directed by David Hand, William Cottrell, Wilford Jackson, Larry Morey, Pierce Pierce, and Ben Sharpstein. Somebody had production problems. <laughs> <laughs> Written by Ted Sears, Richard Creeden, Otto Englander, Dick Rickard, Earl Hurd, Meryl DeMarie, Dorothy Ann Blank, Webb Smith, adapting the fairy tale by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. How many rewrites? How many, folks? And then starring Adriana Casalotti, Harry Stockwell, Lucille Laverne, Roy Atwell, and Stuart Buchanan. This one is about an exiled into danger, uh, exiled into the dangerous forest by her wicked stepmother. A princess is rescued by seven dwarf miners who make her part of their household. Uh, Re-release, not celebrating an anniversary, nor is there a Don Bluth cartoon coming out near it to try to kneecap who are they spiting i don't know who they're spiting like right now they usually release these to like is there like a vhs the band you get your hands on or something i don't know they like i think this was just at the time when they were just they were doing they were just releasing one of these just casually just, releasing snow you know, bikes like, out of the disney vault mm -hmm. it wasn't pinocchio pinocchio was in 92 yeah. Uh, Wonder One Dalmatians was in '91. That one did like 63 million. That summer. That one like frequently got really, really. Yeah, because yeah. uh, one thing that summer was a very kid unfriendly summer comparatively, mm. so there wasn't much else. Gotcha. I uh, I saw this one in the re-release, and I also saw it. I was take my mom loves Snow White, so uh, I saw I got taken to the theater. This one I got taken to. She took me to it. My first time I saw it was like in the '80s at some point when I was a kid. And we had to leave the theater because that witch scared the shit out of me when she turned into the one with the the hood and the, the, the apple and all that. So, but yeah, so Snow White, Scott, Scott, Snow oh, White. Hi. Sorry, I was turning on my cat. Um, uh, yawn. I mean, it's, it's Disney's first animated movie. It's officially the first feature length animated film, although. I think there's a few others that precede it. They were just less high profile. Um, with the caveat that I enjoy Dr. L. I oh. think Snow White and the Seven <laughs> Snow White and the Seven Doors is sort of like the Dr. No of the Disney animated where it is interesting and noteworthy because it is the first, but it is by no means the best. And they got a lot better a lot faster. Or they got a lot better really quickly. Because, you know, it, it's Pinocchio is just a lot better on every level. And I think Snow White is, you know, obviously it's a very primal story. It's been re remade 10,000 times. Um, and the animation is very impressive for its time period. But like a lot of the earlier, the Disney, you know, frankly, the Walt Disney era animated films, is very episodic. It's very narrative light and really almost character light i mean yeah the, the dwarves are charming whatever and but especially in retrospect there's nothing in snow white and the seven dwarves that you can't get somewhere else much better in the early disney animated canon like sleeping beauty for example which is just visually spectacular and you know, the characters are more interesting the the quote-unquote action scenes are more impressive uh, the villain is obviously more cooler um and while snow white and the seven dwarves is an interesting picture to watch from a historical perspective and i admire the hell of what they pulled off in 1938 it's never going to be the one that i'm going to watch purely for pleasure you know if i want to watch an old disney cartoon it's probably either going to be uh, pinocchio or sleeping beauty not 101 dalmatians because dogs suck <laughs> gotcha aaron Jeez, shots fired by Scott at the <laughs> grave of Walt Disney. And dogs. <laughs> the, 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 the notable good person, <laughs> not controversial at all, Walt Disney. <laughs> Shut up, Meryl Streep. 
Um, <laughs> I'm so taken aback by this, like this this mediocre take on Snow White, as if it's done some disservice. <laughs> um, it's a, I, I think it's a classic mm. for obvious reasons, and even beyond the like it did it first concept or like the ambition for the time, I still think the things to recognize about the movie don't really fall into the categories that Scott's trying to narrow down here. I think just the the existence of it is impressive in itself and i do find it very watchable it's for one thing it's not a long movie but also like yeah i'm not looking at snow white being like oh man snow white rules because of how well developed snow white and the witch are it's more and it's there the queen are i it's just the just the taking in what you could do at that time and watching that be brought to life via Dis- essentially disney magic given all the techniques they yeah. had to use back then for those specifically for those first four or five Disney features, like Fantasia is my favorite Disney film of all time, let alone of that era, like that for that pre World War II era. Yeah, um, Fantasia fucking rocks. And we we talked about this in our Pinocchio commentary, and out now there in an Abe. Um, and I think Pinocchio, like Snow White, yes, it's not ranking number one for me, or probably not even number three or five for me. However, I do think the movie absolutely like nails just being something special. Uh, it doesn't feel like homework to me. It doesn't feel like something that needed to start something. It feels like a piece of animated magic that's easily rivals other things that have come in just by the nature of how it's been made, how lean it has to be, yet accomplishes so much, and how it moves around between different genres to a degree. Like, it's a fantasy, but it has horror elements. It has comedy. It has its musical numbers. It... <laughs> It hits that, like, we're early Disney where things don't have to resemble real life, despite using real life models and things to kind of base stuff off of. So it, like, has a extraordinary feel to just how these character designs or these animals or things, they just look a bit different, as in, you can't do this in any other way except through animation. And that always rings true when I watch Snow White. So it's, again, yeah, I could agree that it's not the one that I reach for first. I don't watch it all the time. But putting it on, it's like, well, yeah, this is just one of those perfect Disney movies that existed. Yeah, I I like Snow White as well. Um, I haven't watched it in a long time uh, until before this, and I popped it on. Uh, I was uh, amused at how slim it is. Like, <laughs> it opens up, it's got this narrow, and we are like woodsmen in the forest right away. I was like, whoa, whoa, we don't have any buildup to it. Like, it's... Get the fuck out of town, Snow White! Oh God! Like, <laughs> when you when you saw when you saw him, you're like, oh man, there's Crips Headsworth right there. Got to see that. See him? Yeah. <laughs> Not quite Liam, but definitely a Chris. Uh, what was the Brendan Gleeson movie from a while back where he, he's a he's a uh, priest that's marked for murder? Calvary. Yeah, okay. which just the first line of dialogue, bam, plot. Yeah, yeah. no, this. Uh, so uh, yeah i like the animation here it's impressive and i like scott it was kind of making me think um we watched we did bambi for summer of 82 and 40 and there's a lot of that flexing going on here because it's their first one there's a lot of there's not there's just a lot of like showing off with the animation which fine because you're trying to be like look disney's here this is what we're gonna do um but this is yeah really light on things you say episodic but it's that's i mean yes i guess you could break it into these episodes but it's just floating along just kind of waiting uh i like the, the queen's awesome villain man she's yeah. ruthless and scary and uh, the animation gets way better when she turns so she like whenever she's around i love the animation probably the most even the rich castle and her outfit the mirror and then the mirror. when she becomes the the witch or the haggardly woman it's like creepy as hell and just the lighting changes and stuff i i like that but yeah this is there, there's fun with the dwarves there's some funny stuff there but yeah this is like a half hour story stretched to like a hour and a half yeah. um is what they, they do like i i thought it's like oh, is this gonna be like an hour just barely over an hour like some of these could be i was like oh no it's actually pretty long 82 yeah we're yeah like it's dumbo 69 yeah. like yeah yeah, yeah. so it, but I, I like it it's um the quantum of solace in early disney movies yeah but it's good <laughs> <laughs> Period. So, I don't know. I think the I think the the this is the the beginning. 
but the the perfection like we got it down and this is the best we could do is probably at sleeping beauty which is funny because the successes of both are the polar opposite one launched it one almost ended it um but yeah sleeping beauty is like that put in the best action like we've been doing this we've been and cinderella is good too but like cinderella i don't think anyone ever like goes oh man the the animation on cinderella is marvelous like sleeping beauty is like move a frame stop print put it on my wall move a frame stop print put it like someone blinked i want that one on my wall sleeping beauty was there all no guts no glory movie where it's like we're putting all of our money to this yeah we failed Um, and we nearly failed ourselves but we did it (laughs) they did it we're all you know let time go by keep re-releasing it make people think it's a classic uh the classic disney strategy the classic disney strategy don't tell them it flopped yeah it's in the vault, but you're on you're streaming. What vault do you have? <laughs> vault is cardboard. Yeah. <laughs> Going back, I had this Disney clamshell case VHS of Snow White. I've had it on DVD, Blu-ray, and I don't is it on 4K? I think not it, yet. It's coming. Not yet. It's oh that's right. It's coming. Cinderella's coming to 4K as well. Cinderella's coming to 4K, yeah. That's right. So um, but yeah, I it's a Nice little movie. Um, they would yeah. do, you know, they would do better. Um, but yeah, it's yeah, of it's like, no House of Cards. No. <laughs> oh, no. no. Yeah, you went hard on <laughs> you went hard on Snow White, and then you're like, ah, oh, House of Cards. You know, it's fun. no. I mean, it's it's That's watching tough. it this time. Obviously, I think at worst, it's a really well made for its time three star picture. Mm-hmm. that has a lot of potential but in terms of its own things like it's it's good yeah, but it's fuck, Pinocchio is a well lot made better. for its time three star picture yeah. Stop. <laughs> you aren't worthy of having a ride at the studio at the theme park <laughs> let Damn alone right. two <laughs> you stupid dwarves um, they have a ride who what who so I mean, it's no. Yeah, no. So they got the roller coaster, but then it used to be the one where the fucking woman the chases you, and it's it's one of those old car ones. It's scary as shit, like Mister Toad. Yeah, Wind that's the what we. I, see, I, I have Disneyland, so yes, that's all we have. We don't have the the mine cart ride thing. Oh, you don't have the mine cart ride? Okay. Yeah, that that one's in Florida. That's it's a pretty sick coaster for what it is. Like, oh, okay. Um, but, but yeah, put that on Yelp. Pretty sick poster for the mine cart ride. Pretty <laughs> sick coaster. <laughs> For kids, I get it. Scott's just mad that his kids wouldn't watch Snow White with them. We can, yeah. <laughs> All right, so we'll uh, they one place, right. one you know, Scott may not have wanted to go to the theater for Snow White, he'd prefer to watch it on TV, probably. So we'll go <laughs> see if it made the ratings because no, it didn't because it was in theaters. But I'll tell you, I'd love to see Sleeping Beauty in the theater one of these days when something like Capitan for whatever reason 70 millimeter, 70 yeah. millimeter IMAX. I, I'd be there, yeah. Every year, children are injured or killed in accidents that could have been prevented. Learn how to keep your family safe on the season finale of Rescue 911, Tuesday. This is CBS. Uh, All right. So uh, this week of the ratings, uh, number one, Home Improvement's back on ABC, which means Roseanne is number two on ABC, and Coach is number three on ABC, number four, Primetime Live. On ABC, uh, would ABC be number five, too? No. It's when no one would listen on CBS. That is not the alternate title of this podcast. Oh, harsh, dude. I'm giving up my Wednesday night for you, man. Oh, yeah. All right. So when no one would listen is a TV movie from 1992 starring Michelle Lee. James Ferentino, John Spencer, Lee Garlington, Andy McAfee, Chris Nash, uh, directed by Armand Mastriani. It's uh, Jessica has been married to her controlling husband, Gary, for years. The abuse only gets worse when she gets a job at a bakery and makes two really or meet, yeah, makes two really caring friends, her coworker and neighbor Lee and her boss, Walter. It sounds like waitress. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, it does sound <laughs> a little bit like waitress. Waitress. A remake of <laughs> when no one would listen from CBS. Um, 
Okay, uh, number six, Dateline on NBC. Number seven, 2020, ABC. Eight, Seinfeld on ABC. Ba-dum, ba-dum, boom, 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 boom. Number nine on ABC, another TV movie getting rerun from 1992. It's The Last POW. Or no, The Last POW, colon, The Bobby Garwood Story, starring... Is it a question? Yeah, it is a question. It's a question. <laughs> Uh, starring Ralph Macchio and Martin oh. Sheen. Oh boy! Directed by George Stanford Brown. Uh, true story about war prisoner Robert Garwood. I would hope so. It's the Bobby Garwood story. Is he like? Is he young, played by Ralph Macchio, and old, played by Martin? No, Sheen? they're together. They're together. So, oh. well, yeah, Martin Sheen's the one's like, "We're gonna get out of this, right? Yeah." And then when it gets to, it, it's like, "You go ahead." I was oh, so like, "He's the Sean Tob and." <laughs> She was the Robert Downey Jr. And and the Bobby like Bo- That's my is, reference. <laughs> the, his name's Bobby Bobby uh Smithinson. And then he's like <laughs> Julia Julius Garwood and he dies. And then he goes back to Julius's home and he's like put something by a tree. And someone's like, What's your name? And he's like, Bobby. Bobby what? Garwood. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Force I just ghost. retold this true story. Yeah. And then the force ghost and Bobby Garwood's like, or Julius Garwood's like. All right. So number 10. And then uh, they show the sequels for indefinite. Right. Uh, so number 10, I was excited to see this pop up. Rescue 911 on CBS. Jeez. Oh, with William Shatner. Boom, ba boom, boom. Rescue 911. Which it was a show, the, right? It was a show. It was basically it was a dramatization about nine one one calls, <laughs> and William Shatner was the host. Oh, so it's like a reality. Oh, so it's a, okay. It, so it's like okay. it's like it's kind of like unsolved mysteries, but they're they're got not it. like unsolved. But you got yeah, like the guy. Calls. Yeah, okay. yeah. It's just nine one one calls and what people did for them, and it's got the real people being like, "Well, yeah, I picked up the phone because I work at the operator nine one one." Just choking, and I said, "No." Uh, but SNL did a really good. So one of my favorite S- episodes of Saturday Night Live of all time was in the '90s when Patrick Stewart hosted, oh, and they God. did yes. they did it's rescue. Insulting. They Wait. did <laughs> rescue. They did rescue nine one one with Patrick Stewart instead of William Shatner. And every time you go to a clip, you'd be like, "Engage." <laughs> and, and then uh, that episode also had my favorite commercial they've ever done. Philadelphia, the action figures. <laughs> the battle for justice continues. Now, in your home. Now, now with the or the the court uh, courtroom with ejector seat. You won't fire me for having AIDS. Boom. And then, like, what is happening to Miguel? He is changing, morphing Miguel. And like, coming. You've actually seen this one. This sounds familiar. Coming soon, Philadelphia, the video game. It'll look like Top Gun airplanes. I have that seen entire. That yeah, he's yeah. right. That entire episode's a banger. And then it yeah, also love had both the next generation. And it had uh, the amazing laser was the other commercial with Chris. Uh, it was the year Chris Elliott and Janine Garofalo were on, and amazing laser was just laser that would just make like your trash disappear. Then it started doing like household objects and the dog. And then it's like, and there was like a disclaimer that was going through. It's like, on second thought, don't buy a Mason laser. Are they like one, two season wonders? Is that what they, they're, they're not on. Very they're long. like one, they were, they were one year. Sorry. Yeah. They were like, I don't know what, I think they had a couple big cast members leave. I think it was when like Mike Myers was leaving or if Hartman or somebody and they, they put Garofalo and Elliot in there. And I was a funny year in my opinion, but that Patrick Stewart episode is all timer. Although whenever they would re-air it on Comedy Central or whatever, they would cut the Philadelphia action figures. Bit. I did not know that. Yeah, it made me sad. But that was a such a good one. Like me and my friends in college sought out to try to find and download that commercial because it was so funny. Because we were like, I remember this commercial. And one of them found it in the dark web. But it was nice. The dark but yeah, web. that's kind of the much ado about nothing we would do in college. Oh, which is uh, <laughs> which is our next movie much to do about nothing he brought you henry v and dead again 
Now, Kenneth Branagh brings his unique excitement and vision to one of the great romantic comedies of all time. All women shall pardon me. I will live a bachelor. A dear happiness to women. William Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing. Yes, it's a yes, it's a fight, fight, yay! Starring Kenneth Branagh. Academy Award winner Emma Thompson, Academy Award winner Denzel Washington, Keanu Reeves, Robert Sean Leonard, Michael Keaton, and introducing Kate Beckinsale. The Samuel Goldwyn Company presents Much Ado About Nothing, the most romantic adventure of all. Rated PG-13. Directed by Kenneth Branagh. Who else in the 90s doing Shakespeare? Uh, written by Kenneth Branagh on a play by William Shakespeare. Oh, that's up, makes- up and coming, up and coming playwright William Shakespeare. <laughs> Branagh's trying to give him a fair shake. Starring Kenneth Branagh, Emma Thompson, Keanu Reeves, Kate Beckinsale, Richard Briers, Imelda Staunton, Jimmy Yule, and Brian Blessed! Making his return to the show, he was on Space 1999 Season 1. He was on Doctor Who Season 23, and he was on Space 1999 Season 2. He now joins us here in the summer of 93 at 30 as young lovers and soon-to-be-wed hero and Claudia conspire conspire to get verbal sparring partners and confirm singles Benedict and Beatrice to wed as well. Aaron, you're a big Shakespeare guy. Am I? <laughs> what do you think about what much ado about nothing? So, in the realm of like Shakespeare stories that have been adaptation adaptations, like much ado about nothing's not one of my favorites. I honestly like I I'm not big on like Shakespeare comedies as much as I am the tragedies. Like I like I don't I don't tend to mm-hmm. lean on these as far as like go tos for things to watch. So it doesn't mean I don't like them. It's just more of it's not my preferred Shakespeare. Um, at the same time, I've never actually seen this until now. I've never, I've, mm-hmm. it's, it's always been missing from me. Um, and watching it, knowing the story already, because I've, se- I've seen various versions of it, you know, whatever, including the Joss Whedon, I got a few extra bucks from Avengers, I might as well make something in my backyard version. Um, <laughs> this one, it, it, it's certainly a Kenneth Branagh picture. <laughs> um, and it's, I really like how it opens because it's so gloriously big as far as like ha- establishing this cast and having mm. everyone be everyone in merriment's <laughs> mode as they like get dressed and assemble and all these elaborate things happen to like show everyone getting ready for like the mo- like as if like they know the movie is starting <laughs> so they're all gathering and it, it highlights everybody that's in the film. Um, including denzel washington who for some reason i didn't have in my freaking cast list i thought you didn't say that but sorry I'm gonna, denzel I'm, I'm gonna bring it up now anyway because denzel is like so clearly the best thing for me in this movie <laughs> just be, for one thing i i, I applaud ron off for being even though it's not many but it's still like oh there's some colorblind casting going on there so that's appreciated yeah. uh, but also it's denzel <laughs> so it's like well he's so like he knows his, he's, he's done his shakespeare so it's like seeing him do this with this cast is like such a different sort of flex for him since he's you know a dramatic actor and he's in ostensibly a comedy and, he, and let alone the part he's playing it's like it's still like authoritative but he gets to basically be happy for a whole movie which is like this is fun to see um and like the cast in general is like what you're coming to see here like emma thompson's obviously very good in this um michael keaton's obviously having a blast mm-hmm. of the most overtly comedic role here and he's bringing real Beetlejuice energy to his part as the police guy. Yeah. Um, Branagh is like, like the thing is like Benedict as a character just doesn't do anything for me because he's like supposed to be kind of buffoonish yet, you know, lovely. And it's like, to me, that's just annoying <laughs> to watch. And like Branagh at this time is like, he wants to prove how handsome he is at all times. So it's like, okay, like you're doing your thing. And then you have Robert Sean Leonard as, you know, the, I guess like, I, I mean, like it's not like the, like that's the the thrust of the plot involves him and Kate Beckinsale, Kate Beckinsale's character, right? Mm-hmm. And Robert Sean Leonard's a guy where it's like, you just don't have it, buddy. I'm sorry, like no. you, you just you're just not a movie star. Uh, but this was like that. This is like that post Dead Poets period where they're like, he could be in movies, uh, and then they finally settled on TV later on for him, and it's like, yeah, that makes more sense. House. So, 
Yeah, and he's good on House. There's nothing. I yep. have nothing. No, he's against, very good on House. Oh no, he's I'm, a perfect I'm, foil I'm, for Hugh Laurie. Yeah, yeah. I, have, I have nothing against Robert Joel. It's just more like seeing him in movies like this. It's like, yeah, we were trying with him. Uh, so it's a lot. Again, a lot of it comes down to just like watching this cast and seeing them do the dialogue. It's a very faithful, you know, representation of Shakespeare words. Is that's what Branagh does. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll be curious what you guys think of Keanu. Um, I know this is that like between this and Dracula, it's like we're not doing him any favors, kind of here. But <laughs> no. like, but at the same time, I'm like, well, he is playing like the villain type character here, and like the way he sinks into that. Yes, it's not the best delivery of Shakespeare dialogue. At the same time, it's like. Of the characters he could play in this movie, this does seem the most suited for him. I guess is the best way I can put that's it. Fair. That's, that's fair. That's 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 my best impression. But other than, I mean, like, it's fine. Like, I don't. I'm not, you know, rabid to see this again. It's more like, okay, I've crossed this one off the list. I enjoy watching this cast, seeing all of them again. The opening sequence of all of them on horseback, trying to look as handsome as possible. It's like. Oh, Brana's really going for it with this. Like, like let, me, mm-hmm. let me show you how it's done before he gets his ultimate Blake check and does his like five hour Hamlet a couple years later. It's like, all right. Oh, so, yeah. So, so, yeah, Scott, where are you with this one? I've always enjoyed this one quite a bit. Uh, I saw it in theaters when I was a kid with my mother. Uh, I'm not what I would call a hardcore Shakespeare nerd in any sense of the word, but I. Again, maybe it's just because I like the actors. I think the story is fine. It's obviously very cut and dry as far as this kind of thing goes. Um, yeah, Keanu Reeves is not, <clears throat> I mean, obviously this is the kind of thing that suits him best, but, you know, 30 years later when we see all the other fun stuff he's been doing, this is a performance that's like, ah, fuck it, let him have fun. So it's certainly less of a, uh-oh, what does this mean for his career that he's, he isn't quite well suited to this particular kind of work, but in retrospect, it's like, yeah, he was just, you know, having fun. And, you know, obviously he's acting against a peak, you know, uh, Denzel Washington is peak romantic lead form. You know, Brana is chewing all the scenery he can. Um, and Kate Beckinsale in what, first movie? One of her first yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. One of her first movie. I think she it's was like still in like school or something. Yeah. It's an introducing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, 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 as far as what Brana was doing a little bit of in the 19, late 80s, early 90s, in terms of trying to make these more populist, crowd-pleasing Shakespeare adaptations that were still, you know, weren't going really off the reservation as much as, say, Buzz Lerman's Romeo and Juliet, for example. Um, I think this is probably the most successful one of that. I'm not saying it's a better movie than Henry V, because I don't think it is. But it's just, to me, it's just a shitload of fun. And I think it has its cake and eats it too in terms of being a pretty legit adaptation of the original story while also feeling 30 years ago like a modern crowd-pleasing motion picture. Gotcha. Yeah, I I have to say, like, I'm not, like, this huge Shakespeare nerd. Like, I know a lot of the main stories and stuff like that I enjoy. Um, But, like, watching something like this would make you like, oh man, I could do more of this because it takes the like what's people would probably see as boring, old, or tired, or something they have to learn in school, or they learn it by reading it on the page rather than seeing it performed. Shows it how much fun it could be, and it's mainly like I, I don't. This is the only thing coming up in my mind here, but with this movie, there's Kenneth Branagh, Emma Thompson, and almost everyone trying to keep up with those two yeah. because they're so they are so acing this and I don't think everybody's bad everybody's improved when they're with one of them um and Denzel's adorable like when he comes in like I he's got a little grin on his face I like watching him and Keaton's fun um and his stuff but those two just light it up and when they're together it, this movie is just like fire for me uh they're when they together scenes. still at this point right yes they yeah. are and um, when you're watching this film and you think they're gonna make it forever. Yeah. Um, the nighttime party seat early on was a highlight where he's wearing the mask and they're going, yeah. they're having the exchange and stuff. They're just having a, like he's having a blood, like he's making this movie at the same time. You can just tell he's just loving every second of it. Um, but yeah, it's got a good energy to it. It's not super long. It's not like, oh, this long drawn out Shakespeare. And if you're a dialogue, you know person that likes to sit and hit in the moment rather than just plot to plot to plot to plot and you can sit and watch people act 
and really enjoy exchanges and and enter and actor energy and performance and stuff this is awesome i mean that's granted shakespeare uh but uh there's like a even if you're not like understanding jokes or something you can at least vibe with the people yeah there's the a flow to this thing that really pays really off. pays off like it's there's a cadence there um everybody's like trying their best like to hit it it's got you know beautiful costuming you know sets and stuff like that but like it's just kind of fun to watch play out and i will yeah aaron that like the uh, what's his name the house guy i'm gonna say dead poets guy I can't remember his name right now Robert but like Leonard. yeah he's like a guy who's like yeah i can see why kate back and what would go off of someone else and i <laughs> like he doesn't <laughs> work your case unless that was the point but yeah he's a like the weak probably the weak link in here um well, he, i would, I would say he's more of a plot point than a character right yeah um well, it's, I mean, part of it's because it's this movie so it's so focused on giving you movie star charisma, and it yeah. just feels like he stands out as not having that. And I don't think that's intentional. I think it's more of like casting Keanu or putting someone in here that seems like a deal right now, but it just isn't registering. I think the right maybe I'm maybe I'm way off. And people are just like back in the day we loved Robert John Leonard, but for me, I'm looking at this being like movie star, movie star, movie star, movie star, and you movie star, movie, and it's like. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I, I will say then and now is that their joy is entirely infectious to sure. us, the audience watching the picture. It really does rub off on you in a way that I think mm-hmm. still holds up thirty years later. No, this yeah, it holds up quite well. Like it's, I was oh, I yeah, was I'd rather watch this again than watch like the the Whedon version or some other like other versions I I know or I'm aware of. Um, and if anything, I mean starkly different. But the Denzel connection. Watch this as a comedy, and then watch Tragedy of Macbeth back to back. That's a fun time. Mm. That's a oh fun. god, yes. And they're well, also to... they're also both very stylish. Like this, despite being a big comedy, it very much like I said, it feels like a Brana film. He's using his yeah. camera angles. He's putting in an effort to show choreographed like uh, staging and blocking while while without making it feel stagey. It feels like a movie. I mean, and that's something, especially for you know a well known play. That's something that I certainly like to observe, like seeing like various choices like that made to justify the fact that it's being brought to a, you know, in, in a cinematic capacity. I, I remember walking out of the Trinity of Macbeth thinking, that's your Paddington 3 villain right there. <laughs> yes. I, you know. yeah, no, I'm only half joking. I am. <laughs> Specifically with him doing Macbeth. Yeah, doing that. Yeah, yeah, that <laughs> character. That yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it has to be the you know fire and brimstone thing. What right. we're saying is Paddington should be at a Shakespeare play. That's, that's... Yes. There you go. It would work. People would see it. People would love it. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I, this is a, this is a, it's the one I hadn't seen this week. I'd seen everything else before, and this was a fun thing to, to discover, check out. I would definitely, I'd definitely check it out again. Um, it's better than Belfast. Really <laughs> a hair? Yeah. Also better than Artemis Fowl. I don't oh. hate Belfast, but Jesus, people. <laughs> yeah, it's better than Artemis Fowl. Oh, yeah. Jack Ryan should have recruited. But Mary Shelley's Freddie Stein still kicks ass. <laughs> <laughs> it does, damn it. I, I'm fine with it. I'm not a hater of it. <laughs> Aaron acts like it's all Snow White over there with <laughs> Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. It's better that that is better than House of Cards. That is true. You were nicer to have House of Cards than you were Snow White, Scott. Just yeah, that. The movie was already down. When's Frankenstein? Is the ninety? Is the next year? Ninety four. Okay. Yeah. He goes Coppola. So. Very good, very good. All right, well, we will move on now to our Casey Kasem Top 40, the top 10 of which of the top 40. Casey's biggest hits. Uh, number one, still there. Guess what? Janet Jackson. That's the way love goes. Number two, Weak by SUV. Stay in there. Number three, Knocking the Boots again by H-Town. We have a new number four, jumping up four spots. It's Whoop, There It Is by Tag oh, Team. Yeah. We can dig it. And y'all dig it. Yeah. Uh, Number five is still Have I Told You Lately by Rod Stewart. Number six, Show Me Love by Robin S. Ooh, jump it up here into the top 10 from number 13, Can't Help Falling in Love by UB40. 
That's the uh, Elvis cover uh, from a scene in what? Sliver, right? From yes. earlier this summer. It's now, it's funny, these soundtrack songs take a, long, a while to build up. It happened in the last uh, year's summer of 82, where you'd be like, wait, that was from, like, Eye of the Tiger was like months after Rocky 3 came out that it started like hitting the top 10. Um, and that'll happen again with another song from a movie that came out way earlier in the year. I'll let you know when it happens. Um, number eight is Dre Day by Dr. Dre. Number nine, Come Undone by Duran Duran. And number 10, debuting in the top 10, I'll Never Get Over You, parentheses, Getting Over Me by Expose. So that's, okay. that's your top 10 songs this week. You know who didn't have the top 10 song this week? The Weasel. <laughs> the Weasel. Polly Shore in Son in Law is our next movie. From Hollywood Pictures, into an ordinary town came a stranger. I have arrived! Who became stranger. You guys have chicken? Are they actually crispy original recipe? And stranger. <laughs> Don't leave me hanging! And stranger. Nice pig, nice pig, nice pig! Till something even more peculiar happened. We bonded. Oh! He became one of the family. Son-in-law. Feel the breeze and let it fly. Rated PG-13. Starts Friday, July 2nd at a theater near you. Directed by Steve Rash. Written by Fax Bear, Adam Small, Sean Sheps. On a story by Patrick J. Clifton, Susan McMartin, and Peter M. Blankov. And a real Son in law <laughs> Son-in-law. Starring Har- Polly Shore, Carla Gugino, who I couldn't believe was young at one point in her life. <laughs> Lane Smith, Cindy Pickett, Mason Adams, Patrick Renna, and Tiffany Thiessen. Having gotten a taste of college life, a drastically changed farm girl returns home from Thanksgiving break with her best friend, a flamboyant party animal who is clearly a fish out of water in a small farm town. Son-in-law. So this, I would be accurate to call this Holly Shore's wedding singer. Whereas yeah, like default, yes. Whereas like your parents, other people had no damn interest in any of his other movies, but this is the one they might be okay with and like. And Jerry Duty's his big daddy. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, I, it was funny because this comes after Encino Man. This is his first like leading Encino role type. <laughs> yes. Encino Man comes out, then there's this, and then he does in the army now, jury duty, biodome. You I thought this one came after more than that, but no, it's the launch. Yeah, it's the um, launch. So it's right? kind of back a little bit backwards, Sandler, but Bio uh, is um, Mr. Deeds. Yes. Uh so yeah, so it's kind of like that. Not quite. I remember this movie being like pretty well loved, not loved, but liked back in the day, especially for a Pauly Shore movie. This is the one people are like, well, that one's okay. Of all of them. Um, but yeah, this is a. I haven't seen this probably since uh, then, or around this time, and there was things that surprised me of it where I was like, I don't remember spending this much time before she goes home to college uh, with everything. Uh, but you know, it kind of plays into the the whole. You know, there's that that guy that she's supposed to be with that's really not a good person and does some diabolical stuff. Uh, Polly Shore is just way fish out of water, but becomes beloved in town. Um, I don't know. It, it's uh, I remember thinking this movie was pretty good back in the day, but now I'm just kind of like, eh. All right. Did you laugh? Did I laugh? There might have been like a you have a good time watching it. That's what I have to. Oh no, it was okay. Uh, I didn't hate it. I was like, I was amused that like. Carla Gugino still kind of looks the same <laughs> even then and now. Um, there's a lot of, yeah, the small town stuff. Lane Smith's a good presence. I used to love him on Lois and Clark, the new Adventures of Superman. Yeah, Fred, Fred Wynn dies and mm-hmm. Lane Smith uh, survives uh, for my cousin Vinny. Oh, yes. Yep. There we go. But um, yeah, just kind of a interesting movie there um i did like i mean there, there were definitely lines like when they find like 
She's like, I'll tell mom where you play. We keep her playboys. She's like, oh, what month <laughs> or something like that. I was like, all right, that's kind of funny. But uh, Polly Shore was definitely a presence, a comedian, and he just hit his moment and never transcended like out of this little five year run he has of being somebody. And he was, was he actually an MTV VJ and then spun into like movies or something? Or was he just on MTV a lot? A comedian. Well, I think it's a, more of the latter. He was a DJ, or he was a stand-up comedian like, when he was still a teenager. Yeah. yeah. I think it's so the, the MTV point. thing was what got him something of a profile. Yeah. So, but oh. yeah. But he was probably, if you want to talk about like an MTV generation star, he's probably one of one of them that busted out to movies more than, I can't remember any of the 80s. Looks similar, him was similar to like Jamie Kennedy, one of those, where they're yeah. like, certainly have like this time period and they well he handed him the baton i guess so uh, yeah but Com- compared to like a sandler who yes does evolve over time yet while still doing the same thing he's been right doing, but also does other things there's yeah, no but, other shade to i mean Shore. people saw Polly shore's movies unlike kennedy but <laughs> um, i mean regardless him. seeing him or not kennedy still had a period where he made several movies yes so yes, yes, yes made several movies but yeah, they, yeah. Oh, you can definitely. I would have seen either of them extend beyond that prime period where someone right. like a Sandler, as far as like the you know younger audience that's going to see a certain comedian, he kept going while right. still doing the same, like not changing. He added things to the repertoire, yes. but he still does like the be- the silly comedy stuff. Right. Malibu's most wanted. Murder definitely. Mystery Two is out in a few weeks. Right. <laughs> Malibu's most wanted is definitely like a Pauly Shore script that was like, you want this, Jamie? Yeah, right. He did better than Yahoo Serious. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Scott, what did you think of Son in Law? I didn't like this when I was a kid, and I don't like it now. I, mean, I don't want to be too mean about it because it is what it is. But I was never on the Bully Shore bandwagon. I just thought it was the persona was very obnoxious and not particularly enjoyable to me. Uh, as far as this film, I mean, uh, the the big issue I have with it in retrospect is like everybody treats this guy like he's an alien, <laughs> but you know, the, the film is establishes, you know, they have televisions, they have phones, they have magazines and books. You think they'd have at least enough pop culture to be aware of what the stereotypical California surfer dude was like. And that when this guy rolls, well, he in, acts he, like an a like it's not like he's like kind of different he acts yeah. like a completely different kind of person than anything they'd be comfortable like being two feet away from <laughs> there's there's oh. a, there's eccentric and then there's more eccentric and then there, <laughs> there's there's more eccentric there's extremely eccentric and then there's Polly shore like and that's part of the issue i have with the film is that his behavior is so bonkers bananas that any kind of you know notion of you know let's we'll, guess who's coming to dinner and that kind of lesson in culture class tolerance where is you know it's not just a matter of oh you know these these farm people don't accept him because he's you know a weirdo from california he's genuinely in a benevolent way constantly confrontational in a way that just you know i mean even i you know he would not be fun to have around you know he gets away with it though scott what was that you know why he gets away with it though because it's a movie because he's white like there's no <laughs> there's no like everyone comes to love him and pray like if he was if this was a black guy doing this 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 kind of attitude being just different he'd be ran out of town let alone lynched like there's no like <laughs> all the more reason why i wasn't a fan of this picture and this was like this is like what um, like what do you say eddie griffin yeah, if any guy yeah. came in here <laughs> wearing like you know shorts and like leather jacket, just trying to blend in and but be like, what the hell? <laughs> um, <laughs> There'd be a lot of terms being thrown around that wouldn't be. Well, we can endear <laughs> ourselves to him. <laughs> that's, that's not um, going to happen. And you know, the film is written by a chat PT, whatever you want to, you know, AI metaphor. I mean, because it's it's entirely formulaic. Uh, other than Lane Smith, maybe none of the I, and and. And you know the two young leads. I don't think anyone else makes much of an impression. Um, I mean, in retrospect, it was movie, but as someone that wasn't big on his shtick when I was a kid, I'm not going to pretend that he's some underrated comic, whatever that never got his due. And you know, it just it was a mediocre movie then. I think it's a mediocre movie now. 
-hmm. And I think the fact that it might be one of his better films is just a sign of how much worse, you know, Biodome and Jerry Duty and whatever happened to be. And, you know, it's, it was I a think, mediocrity then and now. I think Jury Duty might have been my favorite. I, I'd say I need Fair. to revisit it, but then I don't want to either. <laughs> 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 I, had to, I had to review Biodome uh, for Blu-ray years ago, and I can tell you, same opinion as when I saw it the first time. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's it's I mean, it's clearly a persona, and I mean, the guy, I mean, his mother owned the comedy store for a very, very long time, mm. so he comes from comedy royalty, um, and it just this was a persona that ne I never found particularly appealing, and judging by the overall box office, I think it was a situation, you know, obviously this is before the internet, but it's a situation where certain like. MTV level popularity was made, or at least awareness was mistaken for mainstream popularity or interest. Gotcha. You know, he was never that big of a draw. He was never someone that people wanted to see on their screens, at least in that persona. It just somewhere along the line, someone got the idea that he's what the kids wanted nowadays. Yeah. I mean, he would, he landed solid, like Encino Man being supporting, and then like, Goofy movie was a big one for him. That's but he was, yeah. but he was, yeah, it's coming later. But yeah, but that was just a voice, voice thing. So, uh, oh. so yeah, I mean, it's I, I don't have that much to. Yeah, well, Aaron has a lot to say about it. So Clearly. Scott's gone on for five minutes, so he had something to say. I mean, I, um... <laughs> um... me ramble? No, no. In turn, I mean, you, you, what you're saying, that last point you're saying, as far as like being, you know, duped into thinking he had it, like he did have an audience. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it's fairly limited. But I'm not going to begrudge a studio for making what I assume is a fairly cheap movie um, to, you know, give this guy a shot and see what happens. It very well just have, it just as well could have been a hit. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I, apparently, it was a hit enough because they make, you know, three more, at least three more Polly Shore movies. Um, but or just keep giving him tries because he's white. Uh, but they give him the earnest tries. What about him as a lawyer or him in the some... army? Or maybe he'll save Christmas. And there's also the whole like on deep video on VHS, it'll still like keep racking up the points and it'll be and it's I mean it was playing yeah. TV like all the time, all these movies were. So I mean I get why you would do that to begin with. This movie is it's entirely fine but bad. That's where I stand with it. It's not a good yeah. movie. I don't disagree with Scott. I'm just in terms of like understanding why this guy was a thing. I get it. Like, it's not hard to, I don't think it's hard to understand why a person like this gets like, th you know, three leading man movies and, you know, a couple supporting roles and co-leads. Um, as far as like my Polly Shore fandom goes, I think he works better in supporting parts because I do think Encino Man works mm -hmm. yeah, as well as it needs to for that kind of movie with that kind of wacky presence. Um and like him being there on the side as opposed to the guy guiding the plot along yeah i think that's the kind of i'm not going to say like his stick is my kind of comedy but like it in doses it works for me better than seeing it as a full lead thing the reason why this movie works better than jury duty in the army now biodome is because of the formula it's a solid formula like it doesn't mean it's good but like there's a reason why people like wedding singer more than other adam sandler movies I kind of don't. I don't. I'm not a big wedding singer fan, but I get it. As far as it's, you know, for one thing, it appeals to both sides, right? It's a romantic film, so it, you know, for what that's worth in, in the realm of romance in the middle of man child doing stuff. Uh, so, like the 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 idea of that formula being brought for Polly Shore, it's like, yeah, okay, let's make him endearing in a different sort of way. I get it. Does the movie do anything to move the needle? No, because you just have to either really like Polly Shore or not. There's no change in his character he doesn't evolve in any way he just everyone changes around him to suit him um, which is wonderfully great for privilege <laughs> as far as that goes like ah i'll just be myself do the things i do be really off-putting but i'm not, I, i'm well-meaning so therefore the farm will conform uh to me that's how <laughs> that's how the south works right um so uh, <laughs> you know yeah, it worked for eddie murphy you know this is kind of like the like 
the wrong lesson. He's like the wrong lesson learned from Spicoli from Fast Times. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, let's just make a movie about that guy, the scene stealer. He's funny, right? Yeah. And then you're like, oh, there's nothing to him. Which is why, I mean, something like in Seal Man works because he's on the side and he's not like, let's make a Spicoli movie. Uh, that's exactly right, Brad. And that is like the kind of the, you know, the the output that would come from there. Um, just one reason why On Stranger Tides is by far the worst by the Caribbean. Exactly. Exactly. That's why Shroot Farms never went to series. Yeah. I forgot that that was going to be a thing. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Wait, what never went to series? The Dwight, Dwight spinoff. The, the oh. Dwight spinoff of The Office. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, I mean, there's not much to add here. Like, it's, you know, it's not a good movie. It's not painful it's just more of if you like probably sure a lot then this is probably the higher tier version of that but if you don't then there's no reason to watch it at best i mean it's at best the best recommendation for it is a shrug like yeah, maybe you You're know it, really in the 90s nostalgia like this yeah. this would be a there's a lot of movies that got like have the same skeleton as this movie that are way better like that's sure. with better people in it like i mean it's neat. To, this is when they were trying to like, oh, the girl from Saved by the Bell, put her in that movie. Um, there's, you know, you know, uh, Carla Gugino becomes the biggest star out of this thing. Um, I don't know what else she was doing at this time. There's, but uh, I think Spin City was a few years later. Spin City, a few years later. Because she can, she comes in later on in that show too. I think it's later. Mm, I think she was there from the beginning but i'll have to double check it starts at what 97 98 yeah now i'm curious because hmm. i think that's where i first noticed her just you know um yeah because she only did a couple of very minor pictures before this or between this and spin city in 96 hmm. uh yeah 95 96 she was in uh you know what she did she left after the did she leave after the first season I don't remember Spin City. Well, yeah, I think so. She does some, she does some movies. She's in like yeah, Snake Eyes, yep. the Palma. Um, yes. After that, she does become you know a periodic. You know, she's a working actress, and she's mm -hmm. in, you know she's oh her that kind of that level because they give her like because they do the out of sight spinoff of they do the yes. show. right yep it gets canceled pretty oh. quickly. She stars in like lots of what. Well, She's like Robert Rodriguez stuff a lot. She's like the Spy Kids mom. Spy Kids for... mom. Yeah. She's in Sin City. Um, yeah. But yeah. And she had that really cool Stephen King one or uh the uh one with Bruce Greenwood, Greenwood. in the bed. Yeah, okay. Like yeah. Gerald's game. Yeah. Wait, yeah. but for for the younger listeners who may be curious about nineteen ninety three people. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that's the younger list. Let's go to one of our older people as we talked about uh, Yancey and his tales from the video <laughs> store. I want to be A little bit more than two years ago, I was uh, you know, working in a video store. I've been working in a video store for like about five years. And aside from writing my scripts that no one ever read, uh, you know, my only form of artistic expression was managing this video store. I had like, a, not a shelf, but like a bookcase that was my own that every week I featured stuff. And they were like little mini film festivals every week. And it was like, um, during the Heist Film Festival, all this stuff is sitting up there, like Thomas Crown Affair, and the Asphalt Jungle, Top Copy and everything. And then I'm like looking at them, and I think, God, you know, these are pretty cool. Why does, you know, I haven't seen one of these made in a long time. Why doesn't somebody make a Heist film? And that's like kind of what put the idea in my mind for Reservoir Dogs. The funny story is that I've been to video archives probably four or five or six times in my life inside, at least before mm -hmm. Quentin Tarantino became famous before Reservoir Dogs, just enough times to, to, to remember what it looked like in there. And, and morally, I just remember riding past it so many, so many times on the way to the movie theater. They used to have a big back to the future thing in the window. And, and, but anyway, so it's 1992 Arnie, my buddy, the funny guy with the sloppy and the stinkers, he and I go, um, to the first showing on the first day of Reservoir Dogs because the reviews have been so great. I had no idea who this guy who made it was, but they're, they got an A in the Entertainment Weekly and it sounded great. And right. we were going to see everything. We were, this is right after high school, we were going to see everything on the first show at the first day because neither one of us was working, as I recall. 
So we went to the 1120 show or whatever, Reservoir Dogs, and we both loved it. We walked out, and there's Quentin Tarantino standing there. I recognized him from the movie, having just seen him as Mr. Brown. He's talking to people. And Arnie and I walk up to him and say, hey, good to meet you. That That's the best movie of the year. And he goes, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm like, that seems like a good guy. We walk away, and Arnie turns to me and goes, you know damn well that Twin Peaks Firewalk with me is the best movie of the year. And I said, yes, it is. <laughs> I said, yes, it is, and so do you. But you don't walk up to this guy on the first day and say, hey, you think that's the second best movie of the year. The, the guy wants to hear it's the best, by all intents yeah. and purposes. It's, you know, and Twin Peaks Fire Walk with me, everybody hated it but us at the time. So it's almost like a secret. That's your favorite movie of the year. Right. But he knew it, and I knew it. <laughs> okay, Yancy, uh, thank you very much. Uh, our next film coming up, talking about The Firm. We ought to keep him on a pretty tight leash. You've got nothing to be suspicious about. I get paid to be suspicious when I got nothing to be suspicious about. Tom Cruise. If those guys at the stake joint were feds, you better watch out for them. In the motion picture suspense thriller of the year. Your life as you know it is over. If we run, they find us. Based on the number one bestseller. Nobody has ever left us. Nobody. The Firm. Rated R. Starts Wednesday, June 30th, everywhere. Directed by Sidney Pollock. Written by David Rabe. David Raphael. Robert Town on a novel by John Grisham. If you're not Triton, you're Grisham. Uh, starring Tom Cruise, Gene Triplehorn, Gene Hackman, Hal Holbrook, Terry Kinney, Wilford Brimley, Ed Harris, Holly Hunter, David Strathairn. Back for another summer, David Strathairn. Strathairn's over. Uh, <laughs> Gary Busey and Tobin, about to be Summer of Bell. Yeah. Uh, a young lawyer joins a prestigious law firm only to discover that it has a sinister dark side. Aaron, tell us about the farm. We went from the farm to the firm. Okay. The perfect transition. Um, first off, Brimley's in this, making it a big Willy weekend. Uh, so... <laughs> Um, I had not grown up with the firm. I had only seen it the first time when pandemic first started, actually. Um, I watched it on HBO Max, uh, and then I watched it again on HBO Max because it's despite being nearly two and a half or it's over two and a half hours, yeah. it's an enjoyable film. It's what I assume Scott Mendelson will call a well acted three star picture. Um, <laughs> it, 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 um, it absolutely does the job that it needs to. I don't know if I like John Grisham films more if they're in the courtroom or out of and around the courtroom, but regardless, they certainly know how to be entertained. Like, you know, I probably like this more than A Time to Kill. I'm like weighing these like star heavy legal dramas, even though that, even though like I like a good courtroom movie, um, saying A Time to Kill is a good courtroom movie is a bit of a stretch. It's a good, it's fine, but there's obviously better courtroom movies. Regardless, The Firm, it's one that's like around it. And I'm like, do I care about the legalese taking place? Not really, but do I like seeing like Tom Cruise and Gene Hackman being like buds who go to the Cayman Islands for 20 minutes out of the movie? It's like, yeah, all right, that's fun. Like, there's a lot of stuff like that where the overall plot, it's like, if this was like a hundred minute movie, I could probably be into like the thriller aspect of it, but it's not, it's so long. And so instead I'm just kind of like trying to get in with tune with the more laid back version of this film that's taking place as far as like yeah these are corrupt but also let's like hang out and talk about it for a while there's a lot of that in this movie very very it's very Sidney Pollock um, in that regard um I like Tom Cruise here when don't you like he does his job he's doing the thing he's got messy hair that's fun um the the stat this cast is just wall to wall we're like I forget how many people are in this like we get like 40 minutes and I'm like David Trathairn like there's so much happening here as far as like star presence that i enjoy because they're being used accordingly uh, like i like that gary Busey shows up for you know a bit and he's really effective in the small minutes that he's in this movie holly hunter gets a supporting actress nomination that seems bizarre to yeah. me but it's not like she's bad um <laughs> it's just the, the piano was so strong they're like let's get it for everything i guess for an oscar um but i mean i <laughs> I don't know what makes this, I guess, I guess what makes this movie better is that the plot is more, the overall plot is boring. Like the, the climax of this thing is so weird as far as there's like both an action chase finale as well as a Tom Cruise kind of bluffs his way talking finale. That It's mm -hmm. like, 
pick a lane. <laughs> like what are we what are we going for here? Ed Harris is bald in this movie. I don't know. There's a lot going on. Uh, like I <laughs> I like I like this movie. It's very watchable. It's not one more like I you know like I, if I'm gonna rank Tom Cruise flicks or Sidney Pollock movies, I don't think either of these are you know are good. It's gonna like jump high on that list. But it's certainly like I said, a very watchable film filled with actors. You know, every, Gene Hackman's obviously great in this. He's Gene Hackman. He's he's fucking great in this movie. Mm-hmm. It's weird to think about the fact that they wanted to recast that character and make it female and have Meryl Streep. And I think of how that would work um, <laughs> in this movie. Um, <laughs> that was and that, that that there's like a whole thing about like why Gene Hackman's name isn't on the poster. It's because he came in late to production because they had like weird thoughts about what this character was going to be. It was going to be Meryl Streep at one point. Like they wanted that and it didn't happen. Is whatever. It's just it's still weird to think like. How would that really? I, I'm so into like, what is that version of this movie like? Does Gene Triplehorn try to seduce Meryl Streep? It's, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> um, that's what that's what I'm wondering. I'm like, is that where it's okay? Like we are even and, now. Like, I, I have no idea. And, then and Grisham, I don't care because I'm imagining it. Oh, and Grisham's the one that shot all this. I was like, no, it's a man. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm like, that doesn't seem to make more sense, especially at this time. What? Uh, who? How would he not have that kind of? Regardless, watch a movie. It's fine. <laughs> I, I enjoy it. Scott, why did you hate the firm? <laughs> it's funny you say that because I had forgotten that that old casting thingy. Because there's like a dozen male characters that you could have gender swapped without making much of an impact on the plot, but that's sort of the one that kind of has to be an old past his prime knows that he's on right? his last legs white guy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like Wilbur Fuck, Brimley. That could have yeah, been Wilbur Cassie Brimley could have been yeah. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> again, there's like a dozen characters that would have. You know, but anyway, um, Won't you come like the with me? I mean, the book this was the book that put Grisham on the map as like the most popular author, give or take Stephen King, for a while. And every, every stereotypical suburban family had a copy on their, their coffee table. Um, so the idea of this book being made into a big budget movie starring Tom Cruise. Fourth of July weekend. I'm sorry? Fourth of July weekend. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, this was, you know, you talk about a time capsule. You know, this was a time when a film like this was expected to be one of the very biggest movies of the summer. Just by virtue of the popularity of the book and the star power of Tom Cruise and the fact that it was expected to be good. And this was also back when, you know, not every movie was two and a half hours. That was actually really unusual for this film to run two and a half hours. Um... But as far as, I still think it's a very good, fun, entertaining picture with a ton of good actors having fun in the material. I like the ending a lot. It's very different from the book in that, like a lot of Tom Cruise protagonists, he's sort of like, you know, how do I save myself and save the day without sullying myself morally? And the big change is that he does of course find a way to have his cake and eat it too and he's able to extract himself from the situation while still following the law and even as a kid i really appreciated that this legal drama had a finale that was very much rooted in the you know intricate tiddly winks of the law um i may not have understood all the nuts and bolts but broadly speaking i i appreciated that he also um, kicks the shit out of william Br- 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 yes after he, he <laughs> like, uh, right um <laughs> After the spectacular foot chase, um, and really, oh, yeah, it was, Tom, it was a Tom Cruise movie. He had to like run a yeah. lot. Oh yeah, we, we joke about yeah. He Ronald. runs after Gene Triplehorn in the street. After, yeah. He jumps out of a window. <laughs> I completely yeah. really forgot that. <laughs> he like breaks the glass. He does a fallout. Um, and it's, it's. I remember it being a fun way of how marketing works, where the scene where he's running after Gene Triplehorn is shown in the trailer in a way to suggest like he's you know running for his life or running from bad guys. Yeah. Um, that was sort of like the, you know, the, the, the cast roll call beat to show him in peril. But anyway, um, yeah, but this, again, it, this is very much a moment in time. The film was very successful um, and it spawned a handful of John Grisham adaptations of varying quality. Um, When's Pelican Brief? Is that later this year? That's, uh, yeah, yeah, about six months couple, later. A couple months later, like December. Yeah. And for a while, that's Denzel Washington's biggest grossing movie. Um. And then you had uh, The Chamber, which was a lot darker, but also wasn't as good of a film. 
Um, Time to Kill was a big hit. Time to Kill was a um, and then you had uh, the Gingerbread Man, which is directed by Robert Altman, that I think starring Ken Brown. Yeah, yeah. I think as a movie, might be one of the best of these. But it's also it was never terribly commercial. It's it's a, that's, that's what it's, old man Yancey says. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then Francis Ford Coppola's The Rainmaker in late '97, starring uh, Who the Hell Is This? Matt Damon. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah that's again. I, I most of these movies are very good. Um, and then you know the Runaway Jury would be in late you know mid 2004, at which point back. the time had passed and there wasn't. The hack is back. Do you remember the line <laughs> from that movie? The what? The line in that movie? Uh, refresh my memory. You're losing me, my jury. <laughs> yeah, the, and this was nice because it was it was sold as watch Gene Hackman and Dustin Hoffman come to blows for the first time on screen. Um, and that was a big deal back then because we cared about stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I like the movie a lot. I think it's, 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 it's a good adaptation of a very popular book, um, back when that was enough to be a blockbuster. Um, and if watching the firm makes you sort of nostalgic for this kind of thing, may I happily recommend just because Chase Stane's Miss Sloan, which is a very knowing homage to the nineties John Grisham adaptations. Uh, I don't think it's a terrific picture, but Yeah. Um, and that's all I've got to say about that one now. Yeah, this is a fun film. Um, overall, the, just a watch. Like, this, I mean, I am of that age and came up in a uh, uh, time where just watching actors play on the screen when you get the big ones together is enough to can be enough to make things happen. Uh, and things like in th- big budget thrillers like this. Um, that like uh I I uh I did think like it takes a while a real long while to get to the thriller aspect of it. Like there is a lot of him trying hard to get into the get his job, all that setting up, showing what he's like on the job so far, and the, the corruption type thing sort of slowly sleep seeps in as, as it goes. Um but I also I also thought that um I had a look for a while that like it didn't look like a thriller for a bit, you know. It kind of had yeah, this listen. like, yeah. yeah, it's it's like this looks kind of just I don't know, like not, like Jerry Maguire esque and I <laughs> nice. The, the music <laughs> was very bouncy and, and the the, 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 the Dave piano. Bruce, the it's Dave Bruce's score is great in this movie. And yeah, it was, it was Oscar nominated. It was like, yeah, it should be. It's great. Yeah. Like yeah, it's a good score. Now it's like laid back piano jazz and then mm-hmm. it turns into thriller piano jazz I'm like what this yes <laughs> um i i thought so like wilford brimley was on my mvps of this movie because he is i was telling aaron like i menacingly comical like he's funny but i it's kind of scary on, yeah. like he's he's actually he gets made fun of for being the diabetes guy and being a cocoon and all that but like he, he's a very effective actor he can freaking yeah. bring it like you've seen the thing like stuff like that like and this is top-notch stuff right here like he really adds to the movie like i don't know who else there's probably plenty of actors to throw here but i like Ron goodman Brimley. Was like yeah like, like later to like now like he could he yeah. could like 10 cloverfield lane is like he's doing that where it's like he could be genial but turn into menacing or suspicious mm-hmm. And he's like, I'm taking care of all you guys' of shit, like all the time. And, <laughs> and uh, it, yeah, he's really good here. Um, I did think, though, on the other uh, <laughs> Dean Norris and Tobin Bell, unintentionally oh, yeah. co- comical. Just watch it, like, with, like, just when he like have the camera panning by, like a Tobin Bell look with his big poofy hair, <laughs> and then like play, D- uh, playing D- hitmen no- that always stand out. Yes. Like, who are those guys? They're probably assassins. Well, once <laughs> what they, they're the wet bandits of assassins. They're the wet band like because Dean Norris doesn't talk and he's like, arr, 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 what you doing? Oh like gives these looks, and then when they stand next to each other, they look hilarious. Like they need to be separate. Yeah. But and Toba Bell just like no style to him and just it's he he looks like a guy that doesn't give a shit, but he also thinks he looks cool and he looks like a big dork. And there's so much telling off that, but it's it's hilarious. I, I love those two. But they do start that on. I'm glad you mentioned the foot chase that starts r- roughly around like the museum uh, when he gets spotted and stuff like that's awesome. Uh, and there's a whole lot of um, thing I like about this movie is there's like 
back against the wall. There's like no way he's going to get out of this. And then stuff where I have to wonder if he came up with this entire movie coming up with that one little thing. And he's like, I'm going to write a book around this little thing I found out studying law. Um, but it's a guy, about a guy that he's getting threatened and trying to be manipulated from both sides to where he has to turn around and threaten and manipulate the other sides, which is where he takes things rather than continuing to run and collect that he just, you know what, I can throw it right back at him. Um, I mean, there's some really unsettling scenes in this, uh, some good tension, despite the look of it, not really fun playing thriller, but the scene where Ed Harris and the other cop let Strather go, it's really nerve wracking. Like you go on the street and the phone you got this and it's like, Oh geez. Um, but I like how, uh, everyone's allowed to just be here, act who they are. Like it, it's allowed to have Gary Busey energy when he pops in and be a real, like feels like um, what's that super movie people like and I don't um, Vice Squad is that what it's called or something like that or there's a movie called Vice Squad I don't or know something what... I can't remember something like that but uh, it's like a got a movie that gets got Winks Hauser or something that a lot of people like um, but. It's got that kind of like like B movie energy to it. Um, Holly Hunter's fine, adorable. Um, Oscar Dom, that's okay. Um, but Triple Horn's good. Uh, yeah, it's just this movie works. It's every like it's Triple Horn's the one person taking this like deadly serious. Yeah, like no, like no fun comes from her character. She is the one that is always just like I can't really. Yeah, this is what we got to do now. <laughs> Right. And I I love that this movie, like they threaten him with the the affair thing and he like takes it right to her. He's like, you know what, we need to just I can't let this be held over me. Which is another change of the book. The book he gets mm-hmm. away with not having to tell her about that. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, the the book he basically just steals the money and rats them out to the FBI and presumably gets to Bard and then, you know, lives the rest of his life in hiding. Yeah, the book is played by Christian uh, by um Christian Slater. That's the <laughs> book version of his character is Christian Um <laughs> that's you know the whole he figures out they're committing mail fraud and uses that to sort of get in with the mob or at least buy protection is entirely from the movie. None of mm-hmm. that's in the for I call it, none of it's in the book. Gotcha. Um, I like how the mob is embodied by Jelly from Analyze This. Yes. And, you know, <laughs> and <laughs> also, you know, it's surprise. It's there. like, we're, we're two Goomba guys. We can get well, I love well, when, when they show up, it's like, mm, I wonder who those guys are. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so there's certainly a lot of cast and type and here. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, even back then, it was fun. You know, Wilfred Brimley was against type goofy casting that really worked. Yeah. Yeah, no, this, I mean, and just watching Tom Cruise go to work is just something that is the joy of watching blockbuster movies because he just brings it. We see him play, give similar speeches, but it's always fun to watch them. It's always, yeah, uh, he's just super engaging. You watch because you know he's giving it his all. Like this guy just, I mean, now we're sitting here in 2023 where we know from decades and decades and he's still giving his all. Now he jumps out of planes and does all sorts of crazy stuff. But like, you just know the guy is committed. He jumped out of a window in this movie. It's yes. a legal drama. <laughs> like, <I> mean... <laughs> right. And he did it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yeah, this, yeah, this movie. So good. And then him and Pollock would reunite at the end of the decade uh, for sex parties. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Another film, but, but yeah, no. uh, <laughs> it, you know, it, it I, don't, I don't know if it's ever been brought up this way, but you could almost say like a spiritual sequel to this is like Michael Clayton, where like all the idealism and optimism that Cruz's character has is gone, and now Clooney mm-hmm. is like seen it all before, completely cynical. Yeah, but he's kind of doing this job now. Is like, yeah, I used to be a big time lawyer, now I just kind of I'm a fixer. <laughs> there we the go. Supernatural big budget remake of The Devil's Advocate. Gotcha. Yeah, but this, yeah, this is the John Grisham run of just boom, 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 boom. Like, oh, it's a Grisham one. Oh, it's a Grisham one. Like, you went to go see a John Grisham movie. That was a big deal. Um, close your eyes. This movie's a John Grisham movie. Anyone want? <laughs> Anyone watch the uh, the firm TV shows in that? Josh Lucas. Josh Lucas. Just... I did not actually. Yeah, I didn't watch it. Is it just weekly being like, I wonder if this firm's evil? <laughs> like, <that's>, uh, 
or stretching out the the plot of the, the plot of the book. I don't know, but yeah, Josh Lucas is no Tom Cruise. Um, oh, Hal Holbrook does a lot with a little in this movie, by the way. He does. He's doing yeah. Hal Holbrook. This is who he plays. Like yeah. that's you know that's why he brought it him works in. In a way, of like I like he's on the side of bad, but you're still watching. Be like. But I like having you around, guy. I don't yeah. think. <laughs> well, it's like he showed up. He's like, you guys want mustache or no mustache? Yeah. What do you want? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. But I'm going to bring it. Yeah, like he's yeah, he's very good. Um, and, you know, Hackman can do this in his sleep, but he's so good in this mm-hmm. picture. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, it's a tough part. It's a really, yeah. like, tough part. I know you like, oh, the Adrian White guy lawyer, but, like, it's not easy to play the, the, the arc he goes through and the the stuff that he's got to pull off. I mean, while remaining somewhat sympathetic. Yeah. 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 Oh. Ed Harris has some good like lines in this, but like very like Ed Harris lines where it's like, mm-hmm. I get to swear in the scene. Okay. I'll raise my voice. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Oh yeah. But uh, Scott, let's uh, head over to the box office, see how the firm and our other movies did this week. Uh, the Firm was the number one movie of the J- long July 4th weekend, earning $32.5 million. Unseating the... the dinosaurs. I'm sorry? Unseating the dinosaurs. Unseating yeah. the dinosaurs. Um, yeah, because that's how the box office rolled back in those days. Excuse me. It was actually a wait, two, three, four, yeah, four-day opening weekend. So it must have been uh, Friday to Monday. Um with uh, $32.4 million, 24.5 or four over the Friday to Sunday frame, the film would eventually earn a whopping $158 million domestic and two seventy million worldwide from a $40 million budget. Once again, movies like that made a shit ton of money in terms of rate of return. Mm-hmm. Um, Jurassic Park was in second place, earning a still terrific $25.3 million over the four-day weekend. <laughs> yeah. Uh, cracking two hundred million dollars in uh, the end of day twenty five, uh, it would bring be two or twenty three, twenty four, twenty five, whatever. By the end of by that Monday, it was at two twelve domestic. Uh, Sleeps in, in Seattle would earn another sixteen million over the holiday. With oh, sorry, the the actual Friday to Sunday parts have been complete, but I will say this: Jurassic Park only dropped thirty one percent from Friday to, in Friday to Sunday weekend totals. Um, Anyway, Sleepers in Seattle, $16 million, $43 million after 11 days. Dennis the Menace would earn $10 million. Wait a minute. You skipped one. No, did I? Did you say Snow White? Snow White's next. Oh, I have it at four. Uh, I think we've got the three-day versus the four-day. Okay. Um, But yeah, Dennis the Menace did $10 million for a $26 million total. Uh, it's no way the Seven Dwarfs would open with nine million dollars. We changed the title to Switchblade Sam. A uh, short, sure. why not? And Dennis the Menace. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay. Uh, the this re re release of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, which of course has been re released many times, would earn forty one point six domestic. Jesus! Wow. <laughs> um, movies could. How much more would have made if it were good? <laughs> Like, uh, again, who is Disney spiting with this? Like, it's no, such I'm a just, random thing. To there's do. nothing next week that would suggest they were spiting somebody that I could see. Do they, I think do they, they just wanted to kill they action, have a movie? last action hero, good and dead. Do they have a movie? They like, have a movie coming out in a couple. Oh, uh, they have Hocus Pocus in a couple weeks. Son in law is theirs. Son in law's touch. Oh. Yeah, it's going to be it's a touchstone or whatever. They don't have an animated uh, movie this year, though, right? Yeah. It's been really no. Because it's allowed. Um, even they knew Hocus Pocus sucked. That's why they released Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Anyway, uh, Son in Law, $7 million. It would eventually earn approximately. Sorry, I actually closed the box. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, it would do $36 million on an $8 million budget. So that's a solid hit. Yeah, that's but why you make more money. Other ones were not, yeah. at least not in theatrical. Uh, jury duty did not uh biodome did not etc etc well if they said john grisham's jury duty though that would have movie would that is true and oh, i would yeah. see that if it was john grisham's jury duty um <laughs> john grisham's jury duty and like it starts and it's like oops i meant the weasel <laughs> isn't that kind of silly limits find me guilty um yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> uh, what if that happened what if instead of vin diesel 
Did you love that? It was like, I'm going to give a career rehabilitation to the Poly Shore. Oh, Jesus. Cast them as an Italian wise guy. <laughs> Mamma mia, want pizza from the weasel? Hey, find me guilty of me. It's me, the weasel. Um, last action hero would make a whopping $6.4 million over the holiday weekend for um. a $40 million 18 day total. What's Love Got to Do With It would earn $5.7 million over 1,100 screens, bringing its uh, total to $22 million. Uh, Cliffhanger would be in ninth, and Menace to Society would be in tenth, while Much Ado About Nothing would open in 200, 201 screens for a $1.3 million... Wait a minute. It must have expanded. What the hell? We've been avoiding this one, haven't we? That, that one's been out since May. What took us so long? I was not paying attention to this. Needed more theaters. Fair enough. More anyway, theaters. it would eventually earn $22.5 million domestic, which is more than good enough. But this would be the peak in terms of its domestic play. It would earn $1.3 million in 201 screens. Shocking, because it was really easy for me to find a theater to see it at. Is this Brana's third? It's what? Henry, uh, Dead Again, and then this? Or yes. It's just, it's just these three, right? It's so weird because I, mean, I saw this in a regular boring old first. It op- okay, so Scott, it opened in New York on May 6th. That was it. Yes. And then but it I, opened I, wide on July 2nd. But I'm looking at this, it never went wider than 204 theaters, which, okay, yeah. fine, whatever. Fine. But I remember it being a wide release. Oh. Again, my, you know, I was able to see it in a normal theater quite easily. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe it was playing in your, it was nothing. select cities. Yeah. Akron, Ohio was the, you know, the bomb for Shakespeare. Uh, anyway, that's the box office. All right. Oh, and Unforgiven and Send a Woman is still in the top 15. There Send we go. <laughs> All right. All right. That'll do it for this weekend. That was July 2nd through 4th, 1993. A lot of fireworks had, a lot of weaseling. And uh, Scott and Aaron, thank you for joining me as always. Before we sign out, let people know where they can keep up with you, Scott. I'm at therap.com. I'm on Twitter at, at Scott Mendelson. And Aaron. I write movie reviews for WeLiveEntertainment.com. I write Blu-ray and Criterion reviews for Why So Blue. I host the podcast with my friend Abe. It's called Out Now with Aaron and Abe. Um, and I'm on Twitter at Aaron's VS4. All right. So uh, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at brand 4 qhd We're work at WhySoBlue.com. Next week, Rookie of the Year, Scott Mendelson winds up in the line of fire. And Aaron and I have to convince an audience of a dozen listeners he's still alive and recording. All that more as the summer of 93 at 30 continues. It's the summer of 93 at 30. Thank you for listening. The Brandon Peters Show is a Creative Zombie Studios production. Produced by Brad Shoemaker and Brandon Peters. Written and edited by Brandon Peters. Announcer vocals by Jessica Olsman. Theme song by Metavari. Web design and show art by Brad Shoemaker with Brandon Peters. All music and clips featured in the episode are property of their respective studios and no infringement is intended. The summer of and news themes by Press Maxson. Additional information on this and other episodes at thebrandonpetershow.com. For any inquiries, press opportunities, or sponsorship, contact mail at thebrandonpetershow.com. The show is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere podcasts are found.